Good morning. I'm Bob Peterson with the Housing Finance Commission. We're excited you could all join us for our first coffee talk of the 2023 Friends of Housing awardees. Today we'll learn more about five amazing housing leaders. Bao Nguyen, Liz Prince, Cheryl Lee for the Korean Women's Association, Susan Grindle for Hope Source, and Lisa Lipinski. We recognized them and three others at our Friends of Housing Awards a couple of weeks ago at Housing Washington held in Tacoma. But we also wanted to gather folks virtually to meet them and learn more from their expertise and passion. And so here we are together as a group. First, we're going to introduce our, introduce our awardees and ask a question about each one in turn. We'll spend about seven minutes with each person. Then we'll go back and get more dialogue going on as, as a collective group. As we go along, please feel free to put your questions in the chat or in the Q&A and be sure to indicate who the question is for. And with that, here's our first awardee, Bao Nguyen, winner of the Emerging Leader Award. So Bao, after growing up as a resident of Seattle Housing Authority's Rainier Vista, you now shine as a manager of the property as well as Lake City Court. His leadership fosters collaboration, problem solving, and trust among the staff and residents alike. So Bao, not everyone who works at affordable housing has actually lived in affordable housing, but you are managing a property you grew up in. How does the expertise affect the decisions you make as a leader and your relationship with your community? Well, for me, growing up, I was able, when I started working at Seattle Housing, I was able to see both sides of the picture. Coming in as a resident, when they have bring in the concern, I'm able to visualize how it looks like inside their unit or what their situation is. So it helps me understand them a little bit better than if I were not living in uh, Seattle Housing Authority before. So it gives me uh, a connection with the residents. And the residents, knowing that I also grew up in Seattle Housing, um, has a little bit more trust in me, and we have um, better understanding of each other. Great. Um, it so all comes down to, like I said uh, during my speech, was trust is uh, one of those things that takes us a very long way. And having lived there, you have some trust. So you came in with fresh eyes, or eyes of uh, that experience. What do you think needs to be changed and refreshed in our housing system? Hmm. So for it's kind of a give and take, I would say, where we're trying to help them be self-sufficient, but not give them everything. And we want the residents to understand that we're here to support them, help them, and be a stepping stone for them. In your experiences, having lived there to now being a leader in, in mm -hmm. that housing development, how do you bridge the gap of people who know you as Bao, their friend versus Bao management? How's that challenge for you? Well, I'm lucky because they they also have, they set their own boundaries with me where if I'm not working, they don't bother me or call me. They're only we approach me when it's working hours, which is nice because they help me separate between work and home, right? And, uh, but as a neighbor, they're free to tell me like all the concerns that I, we just had a situation just on Monday night, uh, one of the dryers caught on fire. And the residents came to me and then, well, they gathered around the area and then I was there because I was on the on-call and they said, hey, Bao, um, there's some concerns we'd like to bring up to you. And it's we can't always come to the office to see you because you're busy. But since you're here, we want to approach you because we trust you. We know you for a very long time now. We want to bring this up to you. So they were very comfortable with just telling me all their concerns. That's excellent. Having that relationship from different visions and the fact that they respect you enough to set boundaries. Because boundaries are tough, are tough when you live in the complex. People want to talk to you at all hours of the night. So exactly, exactly. they never knock on my door or anything. But when they see me, they always say hi. You know, happy face, happy smiles. Always positive. And if there is a concern within the neighborhood, they will let me know. So I'm aware of it. And yeah. Well, congratulations on being able to, to live there and bridge those gaps of work and family and friendship. That's always a challenge, I can imagine. Next, I want to turn to Liz Prince. 
I'd like to more, know more about you, our Unsung Hero Awardee. Liz transforms lives through her dedication to DSHS's Aging and Long-Term Support Administration. For example, she lobbied for state-funded subsidies that have enabled over 1,100 people to transition from institutions to independent living. So Liz, my first question for you is, what are the unique housing challenges of the people you serve? And can you give us a few examples of what you, you can do to help them live independently? Yeah, thanks. And I just want to start by saying thank you for, for this lovely um, award and, and for this opportunity for us all, all to talk. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's really important for um, me, my team, the housing and um, employment office in the Aging and Long-Term Support Administration. So thank you. Um, yeah, you know, in addition to um, living in poverty, which is in itself just super hard, um, the folks that we work with, as you mentioned, um, have uh, physical and behavioral challenges due to age and disability. And so I would say, you know, that accessibility is a huge challenge, you know, um, in the, in, in the buildings themselves. Um, and, and also for, you know, when we work with, um, you know, our partners getting around some of that stigma and fear that, that, that folks have about, you know, what is this going to mean if folks are living in our, in our housing? And what we really, um, put a lot of emphasis on is, uh, the support that we offer, um, along with, um, you know, the, the tangible housing that we're able to help people find. So there's um, a bunch of services uh, offered through the Aging and Long-Term Supports Administration, um, and we've developed a whole kind of suite of services that help, um, in particular with people getting, um, you know, moving into the housing and being able to sustain their housing. Um, and there's there's kind of a lot of stuff that you can do to help people. I mean, it's it's both in terms of folks coming in to help you, um, but there's more and more uh, assistive technology available out there for folks. And we're really, we have a push right now to, to make sure that um, people have access to those kind of things because they can make all, all the difference. And it's, it's a super cost-effective way usually to make that, um, to get that support where it's needed, when people need it. Um, and I, I also want just to toss in there, we're also able to do, um, you know, uh, modifications in existing units. Maybe uh, there's, I think a lot of people still don't know that. So, you know, for anybody out there that has units and that, you know, they're, they're wondering if they'll work for people, talk to us because we can actually come in and, um, you know, get rid of some, uh, some steps. We can, um, you know, help, help support infrastructure. So give us a call. So oh, you it's an interesting point right there. So you have do you have nonprofit partners who come in and help do that work, or does the state actually pay for that cost of modifying a unit? We we contract out um and we pay for it. Yes, we do. If if you know the 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 big picture is, you know, if you put some money up front and make an investment, um, boy, does that pay off if people can uh, remain in an independent housing situation, as opposed to needing to move on either to a you know a residential program um, or even a, a nursing facility or other institution, it's really cost effective. Well, currently your focus is on securing tangible housing options in independent market rate housing. Can you share more about your goals and the strategies you are implementing to achieve them? Yeah, um, you know, like I'm sure for everybody in this. In, in this panel, um, you know, it, it's always about making those connections um, and improving the collaboration. And we're always working to um, increase that. So we've been able to the, work with the state legislature um, to, you know, let them know the kind of work that we're doing to make connections to federal vouchers and other resources that are out there um, and, and let them see how their dollars can, you know, help stretch that by giving us uh, money to subsidize folks while they're in that super long process of waiting for those, uh, you know, the federal vouchers, other resources to, to kind of come into play. Um, our, our last um, funding round, we were able to get more 
subsidies for folks coming out of uh, nursing facilities, uh, other institutions, hospitals, and our state psychiatric hospitals. Um, and we're anticipating that we'll be able to continue to do that because it's been so successful. We're really making a, a push right now and for the next legislative session um, to be able to provide subsidies for some of our seniors um, that are finding themselves getting priced out of their of their uh, rentals um, because they have fixed income and the rents just way exceed what they can afford. And I think, you know, I, I meant to do this before I got here, but I was going to look for a statistic. But I think in um, in in shelters, seniors are the biggest growing um, group of individuals. I mean, it's 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 going it's already a crisis and it is just going to get worse because we're all aging. And right now if you've looked at those curves, you know, five, 10, 15, 20 years out, um, this is only going to get worse. So we're, we're really trying to get ahead of it a little bit, ask for uh, subsidies to help fund people that are uh, 55 and older. If we could do some prevention, find out kind of where folks are before they wind up losing their housing. Um, to just get in there and be able to do some more of that work. Um, and the other big thing we're really pushing for is to try and be responsive to some of the, the issues that we hear from our landlords and housing authorities um, in terms of, you know, when they when they are willing to step up and work with our clients, um, we want to be able to help them with the increasing cost of doing business. So, um, you know, I know they're facing huge issues with um, liability costs, insurance, property damages, things like that. So we're trying to build more of that into, um, into the equation as we try and um, bring people on to be partners with us. As a statewide agency, what are some of the challenges you're seeing versus the urban versus the rural environment? What are some of the differences you have to face as far as helping people in housing in those communities? Yeah, you know, and, and, and Washington has, uh, has lots of both. Um, which, which it, it, it's really challenging. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's easier for us to think about being able to provide, um, these supports in urban environments because, you know, you have kind of, you have that, that center, you can more easily get services out to folks, um, out in rural areas. Um, you know, you, you really, it, creating a, a single site, building, you know, for, for folks with disabilities, it's not gonna, it's not gonna work, right? You really need, you really need to put your focus into scattered site, few units here, few units there, um, and then develop the services um, with the wherewithal to be able to, to get through those distances. Um, so, I mean, there's, I know there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of work being done now to try and mitigate some of those gaps, which is important. It's, it's tough. So do you have any nonprofit partners who build housing across the state that you built relationships with for multifamily? I've been thinking. Um, absolutely. We we work with a, a whole bunch. Of, I wish I had a, a list here um, to, to, to name our partners, but um, you know, we, we work with people, we, we, we often call them set asides uh, in, in buildings to say, you know, we can subsidize um, units as they come up for you, if that will help your bottom line, if you will agree, you know, to take um, folks that are part, you know, that are eligible for the Aging and Long-Term Supports Administration uh, services. Um, and, and that kind of, of pairing helps so much because it, it you know, it, there's usually such a large time gap before, you know, here I am, I don't have housing, I need housing right now. Well, there's a, you know, six months, it's going to take you six months, a year to find a place. Um, if we have those set asides, we can move people in much more quickly. Um, so uh, we really, we have a lot of partners that have been willing to do it. It's kind of a, it's a win-win, you know, we help them with their bottom line and they help our clients move in faster. I want to make sure the commission sends you a list of all of our tax credit properties. We have them statewide. They're affordable. Yes, some of them are full. There's waiting lists, but we'll make sure to share the information with you, Liz. Awesome. Thank you so much. Speaking of tax credit properties, here's another partner who we know very well. Let's talk to Susan Grindler from Hope Source. 
winner of our Sustainable Housing Award. Hope Surf is serving Central Washington since 1963, provides over 900 affordable housing units where, while prioritizing environmental sustainability. Their commitment to energy efficiency is exemplified by Sperling Court in Ellingsburg, featuring a 101 kilowatt solar array, reducing electricity bills, electricity bills for tenants by up to 22%. That's significant. Empowering the community center. So Susan, could you elaborate on the steps taken to ensure that housing projects under your management are energy efficient? Why is this important and how do tenants benefit? I am going to, I asked Craig Kelly, who is on screen to join me because uh, without Craig's expertise and commitment to affordable housing and joining Hope Source, we couldn't have done what we're going to do. So if you don't mind, I'll ask Craig to ask answer that particular question. And we will answer as our expertise, you know, uh, matches with the question. Is that okay, Perfect. Bob? Excellent. So Craig, you're up. I uh, guess so. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Okay. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a good question. It's a complex question. We have um, uh, two strategies on affordable housing uh, with Hope Source. We do acquisition rehab of existing um, uh, low-income housing, typically a senior <laughs> family property that also has rural development uh, components to it, and then also new builds with uh, the nine uh, percent uh, typically as well. Um, the the, on the new builds, the primary issue is orienting at the beginning how the structures are uh, uh, oriented uh, to the south or the west, that kind of thing. And also in central Washington, we have a, quite a bit of wind. And so you also want to be a part of that design from the beginning to um, uh, uh, make sure that it mitigates the impact that has on the residents themselves. Um, I mean, you get a nice strong wind and sub-zero uh, cold that can infiltrate your house pretty quickly. So uh, that's critical versus the design of the structure and the layout of the buildings. Um, always bringing in energy efficiency. Um, uh, some of the, uh, especially the new builds where it's required under the uh, the funding, uh, certainly the Evergreen Standard with the housing trust funds. And then uh, bringing in solar power uh, is critical to our business plan. And if the roof lines are oriented in the correct way, we can uh, get 160 panels on a project what that does is uh, it reduces our overall costs on the operations of the project, um, which is a benefit to the property. And it also allows us to, in some cases, if we get, a, can get enough panels on there, um, uh, take on the responsibility of the electrical uh, meters for all residents. And so when we have these spikes in the winter, which are typical, where a, a one bedroom household could end up paying $800 a month on electricity if it's a poorly insulated property. Um, they're paying nothing, the property is covering that. So that's uh, that's critical for us. Um, on the acquisition side, uh, we, uh, in, in, in uh, cooperation with our weatherization department that we also operate in, at Hope Source, we're able to get grants to come in and do weather uh, air sealing on older properties that uh, uh, would not have had that uh, as part of the rehab, adding insulation, uh, again, getting grants for uh, many splits to remove the, the inefficient uh, baseboard heaters or cadet heaters and uh, put in some uh, DHPs, which uh, significantly reduce the amount of uh, energy required to uh, heat a home and also make it more comfortable. And the last thing we, we insist on in our properties is a, a silent, always on bath fan to keep the air constantly moving. So you're not getting that high humidity, which then also increases your energy costs at our properties. So sustainability is, in housing is often involves a balance of environmental benefits and economic considerations. And I hear that loud and clear. How does Hope Source navigate that balance, new versus old? And what future initiative do you have in the pipeline to continue advancing house sustainability in central Washington? And Susan, that for you, I would say, who are you partnering with? Who are you finding the next opportunity? Because as leader, you're out there knocking on doors. <laughs> exactly. And while we do, Hope Source, uh, their mission is to equip, encourage, and empower people with a hand up so that they can sustainably uh, you know, move forward in their life. And we do, we do all the social determinants, food, housing, um, and energy, education, weatherization, uh, we have recovery. So we do a lot of things, 
around helping people overcome the barriers in their lives. But there was always a gap missing. And that gap was even with really good um, relationships with landlords, we're in a college town and uh, vacancies are zero. So we uh, stepped into the first thing, the first affordable housing we did was in 2002, it was a new build. But the gap was we could do all of this, but we couldn't find a place for them to have a you know a roof over their head and an address that was their own. So we put some skin in the game and we began working on either preserving or building add to affordable housing stock. And in 2002, we had that one. And over the years, what we have done is to um, is to increase that. We've purchased private apartment buildings with help from uh, local. You have to have partners. You you need to have relationships with your city, with your county, with your state legislators, with your federal legislators, with your local housing authorities. You have to have those partnerships to be able to move forward in providing affordable housing. And so we cemented the relationships, made sure we were out there. Uh, understanding what they were interested in and how that could match with what we did. And then began uh, looking for a developer, which we found in 2007, who would help us uh, move into that field in a big way. And, and we've had that same developer since 2007. So we're able to do both, add to and preserve properties. That, en that enables us to take homeless, vulnerable, people about to be evicted, people in crisis um, into housing they can afford and housing they can sustain long-term. Because the rental market, if you could get one, is, is more than 50% of your income if you're a low-income person. So we were thoroughly committed to filling that gap. And if there's one thing I would say, we are um, a community action, private nonprofit. There are 32 of us in Washington state and 1100 in the nation. And we're, it's an association, but we each run our own shops. We are private. We can do what we deem to be, be needed in our community. But I would, I would really not just encourage, but push nonprofits who are in our field to get into the housing game. And there's lots of benefits. One of the first big benefits is you can house the people you're serving and you can make sure they're safe, secure, and moving forward. But for your organization, because we now in 2023 own 900 units in four counties that we can do that with, and we have services in six Eastern Washington counties. So we now can house people, permanent supportive housing. We have a pipeline now because of the housing. So we've got emergency shelters, we've got uh, enhanced shelters, we have affordable housing, we have permanent supportive housing. And then our goal is always to help them move through that pipeline into market so that they can afford a market. So we're working always on employment, education, that sort of thing. So except for the permanent supportive housing niche, that's where we're trying to move everyone. And that's where the hand up part comes. We will help you with the hand up, but we're not in the business of handing you out money month after month after month after month. When you are, if you're able, you're not trying to move forward. If you're not able, whole different story, we're with you. So I, uh, in doing that, being in the affordable housing business, we, we get money when we rehab or develop. The developer gets their share, tax credit, investors get their share. We also get money from uh, upfront development costs, and then we get money from the properties which are supporting themselves to put in our bank. So when, 
a grant is late or funding uh, slows down, we've got a reserve. So we aren't like chickens with our head cut off. We've got a three month to four month reserve that we can continue operating full for that long. And if something doesn't change by then, everybody's in trouble. <laughs> so, so we figure we're, we're good. So we're sustaining people in their lives and we're sustaining our organization, both of which are important and we could not do it without affordable housing and especially the tax credit cycles. Well, Susan, thank you so much. I've been a witness to how you built Hope Source, and I can say so much about that. But also, it's a great segue to Cheryl Lee, another organization I know a lot of, the Korean Women's Association, winner of our Housing Intersection Award, originally founded 50 years ago to protect victims of domestic violence. KWA now serves 14 counties and diverse services with five affordable, affordable housing projects and plans for another 88 new senior housing units in downtown Tacoma, my hometown. KWA continues to foster inclusivity, dignity, and belonging for all. So Cheryl, KWA has spent its services over the years to intersect with housing, just as Susan mentioned, great segue. How does this organization evolve to address housing-related needs to promote joy, respect, and dignity within its communities? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I just loved hearing Susan talk about, you know, how the, it's it's like a, a domino effect, really. And just, you know, and also thinking of housing holistically. Yeah. And I think that's what we need to do. One of the issues I see is like a lot of the funding is just so myopic on housing. But, um, you know, from a KWA perspective, as, as was introduced by Bob, you know, we started to house women who were vulnerable, who needed help. And we have is evolved based on the need. But that need, again, is holistic end to end. So really to support many of the seniors who we've finally been able to put in housing. And let me tell you, some of the seniors, they were waiting in queue for over two and a half days. That means they slept on the cement sidewalk before we opened up to take applications. I mean, you know, the scene, talk about it. And so, but you get into the house, but really that's just the basic shell, right? You have seniors who are vulnerable. You have um, low-income housing individuals who, who, for whatever various reasons are in that state they are. And so uh, for seniors, especially um, KWA has, we offer um, in-home care service. So we go through the effort of hiring, training, recruiting, retaining um, caregivers. And of course, talk about um, partnership. I think, you know, between Liz and, and um, you know, and, and she, Susan, you talked about in partnerships, right? With DSHS, state, everything. And we partner with them to make sure that the seniors who are living in these housing it really can live healthy and dignified life. And again, it is very cost-effective if they can be cared for in their homes rather than sent somewhere, you know, obviously to assisted living or whatnot. So we that that's pretty predominantly our kind of majority of the efforts of our 14 offices across 14 county. But it doesn't stop there, though. We also and and the and the the, the creative thing is that in several of these low uh, low low income senior housing, we have KWA actually has staff that is basically that's their office there to provide care such as like you know are they taking care from a food nutrition health care. So we provide all of those social services. We also have our managers who you know schedule caregivers who um, work closely with. A caseworkers from the DSHS and various um, agencies that we partner with to schedule for caregivers into the homes of, of many of our residents of these low-income housing. So really, it's an end-to-end -end holistic approach. Additionally, we also provide meal site services at, again, these apartment housings where, you know, and some of it we cater to the various ethnicities. So for example, on a Monday, we have a lunch that's catered to the ethnic food of the Vietnamese, kind of elderly. Tuesday, it's Cambodian. Thursday, uh, Wednesday, it's Ukrainian, given the influx of the refugees in the community. And then like Thursday, it's Korean. And then Friday, get this, it's international. 
everybody come and enjoy. And, you know, that is just, an, I think, an awesome service where people can come together, socialize. It is just so good for the health of many of those that are residents of our low, low income housing. We also um, provide um, some activities, everything from learning Pray the Ocarina to having simple yoga on site where they can. And even some of these sites, we paid um, extra in addition to funding sources from many of the partners to build the housing. We've uh, raised money so that we can have a little community kind of learning center and, you know, bring in um, folks who can provide haircuts, you know, once every week, again, to make it so that it's so easy. And to your point, um, Bob, that people can really live with joy and dignity and amongst their community. In addition, I, I just did a little bit, we also have um, uh in addition to that, not just seniors, but we also have like transition housing. So one thing that I didn't share is we have a place called Orchard Housing, and it's about transition housing for various individuals for about six, I believe, um, we have a, a, a capacity for six units. And again, this is for people, whatever reason, you know, that they are uh, homeless or need that little bit of a help as a transition house. And get this, it was a garbage dump. And KWA, in partnership with city, you know, the county and cities, we came together and built the housing there. It's got an orchard there that people can, you know, have that mental health as well. And, it, you know, in the past, we limited to six months, but because of the pandemic, we had to extend, okay. right, it's like a longer term transition housing. So we needed to do that. In addition, we also provide um, how, uh, housing vouchers, rental assistant vouchers, which is really important. And then within the also the, um, the uh, domestic violence, you know, that's kind of how KWA started really housing the victims of domestic violence. But we have a beautiful, beautiful home on a one acre property. Again, this was in partnership with Tacoma and, and County and DSHS, but we are able to house up to nine, um, I think two families with children, uh, women or whatever families with children and the individuals. And um, again, it was, you know, for short term, but now we've actually kind of said, you know what, however long it takes for people to help them to get there and to transition. So these are a lot of the services. And what's really interesting about the evolution and the growth of the services of KWA is if you think about it, you know, many, again, I'm gonna just generalize, but many women, right, who, who were, or tended to be the victims of domestic violence, um, we have them there and we provide a lot of advocacy. There's also, you know, advocacy for victims of crime. We provide a lot of like skills development if they need computing help. But we also have this in-home care service that benefits many of the seniors uh, who live in these low-income housing but it, it's also a job opportunity for some of these women or individuals who are looking to make this transition. And I personally know several women who, for whatever reasons, you know, had issues with their husbands, they had no professional training, and they needed health care for themselves and their children, and they were able to become um, caregivers for KWA. And so while they are going through the healing and restoration process, they are also helping um, seniors to live healthy, dignified life. And so that end-to-end -end ecosystem is just something that I'm super proud of. And I think that is something that we, those of us that are in housing, need to continue to think out of the box and really work on this. Because as I said in the beginning, you know, many of the funding that we go for, like, oh, that's only for, you know, low income housing building where well, you can't have like social services as part of that or other, you know, uh, services and needs that people need because you can't just live in a house. You got to eat, you got to function. There's other things you got to do. So, you know, concept of like a, a village, like a senior village where you can have all the services, not only seniors, but, you know, medium income, low income, low, low income, um, you know, commercial, social services, all the services that needs to really help lift up these individuals. If we can be creative in doing more of the partnerships where we can bring these together, I think, uh, you know, we will see um, a lot more impact and improvement in this ongoing, I, I call it, you know, our housing challenge. I almost equate it to pandemic and we really need to work on it together. Okay, Cheryl, put a pin in that. We will come back to that question for all of you. Now let's turn to Lucy Lipinski, our Margaret Savy Lifetime Award awardee. Currently Chief Operating Officer at Spokane Neighborhood Action Partners, known as SNAP, Lucy Lipinski has over three decades of impact in affordable housing development, asset management, 
and nonprofit leadership in the Spokane area. Her career has shown great dedication to equity and community involvement, including her role in the founding of the Human Rights Education Institute. So Lucy, your career in affordable housing development and asset management spans over three decades. So we could ask you almost anything. <laughs> <laughs> but let's talk about your commitment to client perspectives and integrating their feedback into housing initiatives. Can you provide an example of how your client-centric approach quality of affordable housing and services? I have a couple of examples for you, Bob. Uh, in the early 90s, when I was just getting started in this field, uh, I did a senior housing survey. I wasn't an expert and I wanted to be informed on the topic. Uh, I was asked to speak at a conference on senior housing needs. So my agency served five counties. So I surveyed the, the seniors that visited the agency and that visited the senior centers in those five counties. And um, the results were my presentation. The results that came out of that were when I began developing affordable, affordable housing shortly after that, there, there was the consideration for larger kitchens, because that was some of the feedback from the seniors. There was also consideration for two bedrooms for cultural family norms where that was appropriate and a need to be closer to services. And with the power of the five counties of senior data that was fresh, um, I was seen then as an expert and development funds came to the agency first for capacity building and then senior affordable housing. And that was all based on the value of that input from the people that we serve. Uh, another example was the um, no smoking policy, the planning and implementation. It took two years. We were the first to do so in Spokane. And I worked with the Spokane Regional Health District. We developed a plan, rolled it out and went to every community, every property, and spoke to the folks who live there about the policy and what the impact would be on them. And I learned clearly that I hadn't considered all I needed to, and the press was uh, right on top of it and wanted to you know, know what we were gonna do and how it was gonna happen. We went back to the drawing board, we waited for the pet press interest to subside, and then we implemented the program. The harshest critics living in the affected housing later thanked me and some said they stopped smoking uh, and that it was due to the policy implementation. Improving out health outcomes is a big deal and it was directly related to listening, responding um, and, and changing course to, to meet client expectations. So you hit a very good chord there, Lucy. Many of us in this group, except for maybe one person, have I mean, I remember being around restaurants where you had smoking, smoking in the offices. And my career in housing, when that policy first came up about getting rid of smoking and housing, it was controversial. Look where we're at now. So that is that's a great comment. I've heard several themes in your discussions today. Senior housing being one of them is one of the programs that's most difficult to fund because people in senior income areas don't have possible for hiring, getting jobs or raising their income. They're trying to survive. So what do you think are some keys to helping us improve our senior experience? And I'll start with uh, Susan, then I'll go to Cheryl, and I'll go to Liz, L Lucy, and then last you bow on that question. So Susan, what can you do more to help seniors in your mind? I think the biggest thing you can do for seniors because the funding is not there yet. I mean, someday they may, uh, understand that the tsunami that, that was described by Liz originally is coming. And who wants to see their grandmother on the street? No one. Uh, so they, they have to come to, to terms with that. But one of the ways to help that movement, I think, is exactly the partnerships that we're all talking about. The fact that you are talking to your city and county officials, getting them to partner and fund senior projects, because if they're willing to fund at least seed money for senior projects, then you have a better chance of getting other levels of government involved once you have 
uh, what they consider to be a valuable uh, source of, of income for them. So you have to be advocating in those arenas. You can advocate in front of the legislature and, and tell stories, and that's good. Education is good. But until you have solidly made partners of your government officials, it's going to be hard. And we always, we serve seniors, youth, veterans, disabled, uh, rec people in recovery. But what is unfortunately true um, is that poor people are not sexy. Seniors are supposed to have taken good care of themselves. And so the, the compassion for those groups, uh, you know, and deservedly so, veterans, a lot of money. Uh, if you are a baby or uh, an abused a domestic violence, thank heavens now, that is important. So you can get money more readily for those types of groups. So you have to work hard to educate and convince the people with the money, which would be uh, investors, donors, not so much, but in, in on the West side, I take that back, on the West side where you've got um, big companies in your backyard, that's easier you can raise a million dollars over lunch. However, mm -hmm. in the rural areas, you cannot. So you're going to have to figure out ways to do, get your get your locals invested in the partnerships and in the money part of it. Then you have something to take to the other levels that can actually help you um, help seniors. And a quick story is we, when we bought and rehabbed a senior complex, in Ellensburg, the seniors were scared spitless. They thought for sure what we were going to do is fix it all up. And it was gorgeous. It looked like a new house, best they'd ever lived in, that we we're going to raise their rent. Mm -hmm. And so the commissioners of the county at that time, and it's been 10 years ago or more now, the commissioners at that time said, that can't happen here. We have to protect the seniors at the end of their life. And they funded a specific program, Senior Support, that we now can have about 45 seniors at a time on. But to tell them thank you, we brought many of the seniors from that group to the commissioner's meeting because the commissioners never get told thank you for anything. So they came and told the commissioners how important it was to their life. And one lovely older woman in her late 80s came to the microphone and she said, I, I'm so sorry, I just didn't do a very good job of making sure I could, in my senior years, live comfortably. But what when they were, when the commissioners asked some questions. This woman and her husband had been farmers. They had worked hard all their life to support their family, bring up their family, make sure they had a house, make sure everything was going right. And then her husband had a long-term illness that simply sucked all of their resources, their house, their land, their everything they had saved, sucked it out. So she didn't fail to plan. Life Got the way. Did that, But the commissioners understood that. So it was only because of those connections with local entities that you can start to build that compassion for seniors and figure out ways to house them. And, and Cheryl, KWA has done a lot for seniors. What are important things for you you see that can be done more for seniors in the future? Sorry, I forgot to mute. You know, totally... Um, if following after Susan, her comment was, you know, we need to protect seniors at the end of their life. So what we have is we have housing, which allows them to live, you know, healthy, dignified life in their own home. But there's also comes a point where they can no longer receive the care of in-home caregivers. There's just, it's impossible. And I feel like that 
final stage on the last years of their life, we also don't have a very good solution. And that's like some type of assisted living, right? When in-home care is not an option. And unfortunately, I it's my personal opinion, but I think the state of um, assisted living for many seniors, uh, similar to the senior that Susan mentioned, you know, who do not have the means, it's it's pathetic. It's almost borderline inhumane. Again, my personal opinion. And so to me, that's an additional area that we collectively need to think about. And we need to break the code on how we can make it happen. That is within, you know, affordability. So that's a huge um, thing that's on my mind for me in terms of this holistic approach to serving our citizens. And um all of, us, all of us out there, I put the challenge out there. You know, you've got this ton of these housings like done by ages. They're amazing. I have no problem with that, but you need $12,000 a month to get into that, right? Yep. I mean, and, and that's not where we're looking at. They're, the majority, you know, look, the, the, was it was it 2% of the world's population have 90% of the world's, you know, wealth or something. So we really need to focus and figure out how we also make that assisted living a possibility for many of our seniors to transition from the low low income housing um, to really um, fin complete out the rest of their life. And you know what? That's going to be yeah. you and I. It's not just our seniors. It's going to be you and I. And that's the thing that we also need to kind of wake up and realize that, oh, we're not doing this for grandma or mom or this 80 year old woman who came and spoke at an event. It's for you and I. Yep. Thank you. We have Lucy, then Liz, and we'll finish up with Bao. So Lucy, what, in your career, senior housing, I mean, you've done a lot of it. So Talk about seniors. Well, I have to echo that I completely agree with Susan and Cheryl that that's so important. The housing that that is in between that is serviced enriched is so important. And to remember that they want to retain their independence as long as possible. And and um, that we have to find ways to provide this subsidy. Uh, I am planning retirement. I'm going to take a 70% <laughs> cut in pay. <laughs> that's, that's a reality for many people. Um, that's something we all have to think about. Yes, there's planning, but um, things happen, like what happened with this example that Susan gave. And mm -hmm. uh, seniors will need more subsidized housing than there is available now and they will need serviced and rich housing that provides transportation. Mm -hmm. Great. Liz, the state, the funding source, <laughs> you, you've heard from some of your constituents. How can you and your end do this? <laughs> well, as the state, let me say, <laughs> you, you all know I can't do that. Um, but <laughs> there you are can a dream. couple of things. What? You can dream. <laughs> dream one day um you know what everybody's been saying is really um it's, it's a great conversation I, I wish we had more time for it and I, I I just have to say you know I hear when I hear stories of people kind of taking it on like this this is my fault that I don't have enough right now it it both breaks my heart and it makes me furious because um, these are systemic issues. These are things that, you know, our society has created, we, you know, that all, of, all of the ageist stuff, all, all, of, all of the ableist stuff, it's, um, you know, anything can happen to anyone and it does. And it, and it doesn't, you know, it's, it's not about how much money you've been able to earn or even how much you've been able to save, you know, unless we address these things systematically you know, you, you, you stop blaming yourselves, people. <laughs> it's it's not it's not right. Um, and you know, the only other thing that that I'll say, because people have really said a lot here, um, I I do uh, think that we need to uh, advocate strongly and heavily with HUD. I think they need to be providing more subsidies um, across the board. And of course they know that, um, but particularly, you know, when you, when you look historically, they had funded um, stuff for seniors for a long time until there were, I think, you know, the, the, at least the lore was too many, we have vacancies, we can't fill them. So they pulled that back. Um, but these systems are not really nimble enough to kind of 
turn the tide when you're faced with another um, another issue. Um, and right now, you know, seniors, it, it's it's huge. And um, you know, at that level, we really need um, HUD to to be able to step up. And at the state level, I can tell you that the 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 probability of of you know our success in getting state funded subsidies is it moves directly in parallel with what's out there that we can say we're matching right so all of the things that people have said if if more folks step up and if the feds step up i think the state is then much more able to um to do that as well and i i'm i'm given hope because actually the uh Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services um, is is just recently now um, starting to say, yes, we're going to start looking at using our federal dollars for rent um, because they're 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 acknowledging, you know, that the um, that the health and social needs of folks make a huge difference. And housing is one of those things. And so, you know, when I saw that happen um, a couple of years ago for the first time through the Money Follows the Person program, you know, my jaw drops. Like I've been saying forever, Fed, they're never gonna, never gonna pay for rent. They actually are starting to. They need they need to be a little um, less worried about it and and do it for longer periods of time. <laughs> but that's a that's a remarkable thing actually. Thank you, Liz. Val, I'm gonna turn the question for you. You are a young emerging leader. You've grown up in a public housing project where you probably had senior elders in your community, and now you are the person they're looking to. So what are you seeing for seniors? How are you able to help the seniors in your community, especially those who've known you as a youth and to now as a young adult? Right. As you said, I am the, I'm the property manager now where I'm more on site. I get to see the residents more. I I'm able, whenever we walk the property, you know, just check out the property, make sure everything's good. We say hi to them. Usually they're, usually on the sunny days, they're all out and about doing the gardening, you know, just doing their regular walks. But I just wanted to mention what everyone else is saying. It's great, especially when, you know, thinking about my grandparents, they're old now. They're like 70s, 80s. So being able to have that support system for such elderly, it's really amazing. And thank you everyone for that. And for me, because we are not really building anything on my, from my level up or from my level down, um, what we generally do is we do health checks, you know, just welfare checks. And one way we are able to do that is because um, when we collect rent, we notice some people, they don't pay rent. So we, you know, the elderly, we give them a call and be like, hey, is everything okay? Did you forget? Are you out of town visiting, you know, your kids? And if we don't hear from them, we call the family and just check up on them. And if no answers, we get permission from the family. Like, hey, can we check on your mom or dad's unit or your uncle, aunt, or your grandparents? Can we just go in there and check on them? And, you know, we go in there and they're just having a time, having tea with their friends. And, yeah, fortunately, we haven't seen any unfortunate events. Mm -hmm. I, I can know from some of our projects we've done in the tax credit world, we had one developer who did a senior project where he tried to get into every unit at least once a month to check on the wear and tear of the unit, but really to see how that tenant was going. And mm -hmm. that person was consistent. That way they saw if they were starting to need more services. And that's the thing about it. Aging in place has become a huge component for the baby boomer generation that are now entering senior living facilities. So that is great to hear you folks making all those efforts and advocating, as Susan indicated, for more resources because that boom is coming and we're not ready for it. As Liz indicated, we stopped building those units. And as Cheryl talked about, the needs are getting more and more housing, food, services, health care. It's growing in that area. Well, we're nearing the end, and I have one more question for all of you. All of you. Most of the time. Can you give me a name or somebody who, you're, who you most are appreciative, who helped you get to where you're at? Is there somebody you want to recognize who helped you be successful in your career? Start with you, Bao. Um, for me, I would have to give a shout out to my property management administrator, Sydney Strippapod, my senior property manager, Mylon Riggle, and also my previous property manager, Abdi Farah. They're the one who yeah. hired me on from the outside, gave me a chance, taught me along the way, and never was never hesitant to teach me what they know. Great. And, and also, sure. of course, my residents. 
without them, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> Girl, who was inspirational to you? Who helped you get started in this business? Gosh, I don't think it's um, any individual. To me, I think it's the um, the story of um, the founders of KWA, you know, who themselves were settling in a brand new country. Everything is so new. And yet they stepped up to help, you know, their fellow sisters and friends. And they took on that um, that courage to house someone who was fleeing. To me, that is like, you know, I think it's incredibly um, inspirational. And I've had a chance to go live and work in Singapore for a couple of years. Well, you know, they speak a lot of English, but the fact that I was moving to a different, you know, country and trying to establish myself, that was like a lot of work it was a little scary at times. But to think of many of these women who came here knowing very little of the language, the culture, how work, and yet they started all, it's just, it, it, it's really what, what inspired me um, to, to, to bring my passion to KWA and uh, just watch out. You'll see my passion coming into play. Amen. Liz, in your career, who's been instrumental? What's made you be motivated to do that work every day? I, I, I'm 62 and I can't think of, you know, one single name. I mean, I, I think like Cheryl just said, there's so, there were so many moments and, and so many people. And I guess um, now I just have to say that it's, it's the folks that I work with day in, day out, um, the, the folks in the housing and employment office and um, some, and the folks at also that, you know, they, they, they just go above and beyond. And um, it's pretty amazing. I, I feel very lucky. Thank you. We'll go to Susan and we'll end with Lucy. Susan, what got you into this business? What motivates you? Well, indirectly, this is what got me into the business I'm in now. I, I was born and raised in, I'm fourth generation in the county I live in. And like everybody, after they get out of a local environment, you have to go away. So I went away for 20 years and worked in the for-profit world in consulting, in helping companies change the way they thought about the people that work there, the unions, the presidents, the, and all of that. And in that, during that time, I was lucky enough to meet a gentleman named Ray Rogers. And Ray Rogers uh, was the head of the consulting group I was in. And he introduced me to his mother, who was in her 90s at the time, living independently. And I got to see the values that had passed to Ray from his mother generationally. And Ray's impact on me, in, in addition to his extreme expertise in doing that consulting work, was his ability to see every single person as precious. And all the years I've known him, 40, 45 years, I've never heard him say anything negative. He will say, well, that's interesting, but he doesn't condemn other people at all. And that for me is a North Star where I bring it to my heart and say, you know, every person, they didn't start out wanting to be anything but perfect. And life came along. So when I moved back to the Valley and this job was open in nonprofit, I had not done that particular kind of work, but I was fully prepped with examples like Ray that said, the world is a good place. People are good people. Everyone deserves the dignity of a decent life. And so that's what attracted me to Hope Source is that's exactly what they dealt in, is helping people live a dignified life. In your name. Hope source. Hope source. And Lucy, SNAP, in my career, I've known of SNAP since I've been working the commission. You've been a great leader locally and statewide. You're ending your career as you indicated. What has motivated you to keep all this work going for all these years? I have to say it is the people that I serve and, and has been right from the very beginning. That's what got me into affordable housing when I went uh, where I grew up in Los Angeles and I went home to where my great grandmother had lived and saw that it was, um, there were no seniors there. And then I found them in the underpasses with shopping carts elsewhere in the neighborhood. And I came back here and said, that is not happening here. Mm -hmm. It is not happening here. 
and got uh, got a call to interview for a job as the housing director for the local community action agency. Um, it seemed to me the appropriate thing to do. So it has always been that, that the, the folks that I served tell me what the needs are and then I go try and address them. And even today as the chief operating officer at SNAP, when I get tired of beating my head against the bureaucratic wall, you know, can, can I still keep doing this and getting the same answer? Uh, I will go and sit in the lobby and talk with clients and, and hear what they have to say. And it recharges my battery. And I said, yes, I am. I'm going back and I'm, I'm going to fight some more. Well, thank you all for healing up along the route. I think we all have stories of being beaten down and having great success. But the most important thing, we haven't stopped wishing, pushing forward. Time for a little bit of a commercial. The Housing Finance Commission, our partner, Department of Commerce, and our nonprofit partner, Low Income Housing Alliance. Thanks you all. We are part of your ecosystem that makes what you do successful. We need you to continue on. We need you to speak up when you see opportunity for us to do better. But we also need you all to mostly take care of yourself. Self-care is very important when you're doing this work because it is tough. So I want to thank you all for your careers and what you're doing. I look forward to seeing you again, if not in our walks around the town here in Seattle or on the east side at next year's Housing Washington in Spokane. So with that, Thank you all very, very much. And congratulations again. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Yep. Bye. 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 Bye.